Okay. okay, let's start. So, hello, my name is Bill Constantinidis. Um, I'm an actuary by background and a member of the Actuaries Institute Data Science Practice Committee. And that's a group that focuses on education techniques and ethics and emerging issues around data science and data. Um, thank you for attending Data Science Sydney. Um, I'm a co-organiser with uh, Eugene Dubisarski, the founder. Uh, the Actuaries Institute has been sponsoring this group this year for the reason that data scientists and actuaries work closely together and we have overlapping skills with many of our members identifying as data scientists. Um, and I'd like to introduce Eugene to the platform. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bill, and thank you all for coming to yet another and evidently growing Data Science Sydney. It's uh, nice to see uh, us running out of chairs. Some people are choosing to stand just as well. <laughs> uh, so, yes, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for making Data Science Sydney a continuing success. Now, well past its 10th year, I believe. I think this was its 10th year, or was it last year? And uh, hopefully uh, we'll keep growing. Um, a, a reminder for those of you who uh, haven't uh, joined the Data Science Sydney LinkedIn group to please join that. And the reason is because sometimes the email from the meetup group doesn't reach people. And when I say to people, hey, you're coming to Data Science Sydney well, next week, they go, I didn't oh. know there was one. That's because the email goes to spam or something else. So please, right now, pull out your phones. I don't mind. <laughs> join, <laughs> join the uh, LinkedIn group. And um, well, um, let's not uh, dwell too much on process and ceremony, and let's move on to introducing our first speaker, Daniel, who'll be telling us about predicting health outcomes. So Daniel is a data science actuary, which as of about two months ago has become a new and official thing here in the Institute of Actuaries. It's, uh, it's an official title, which uh, a small elite group, including uh, Daniel, now have a claim to. Um, I say that with all serious seriousness. So Daniel is a data science actuary with 20 plus years of experience and has been a qualified actuary for 15 plus years. He has worked in a wide range of fields, including various sized life insurance offices, reinsurance, consulting, and specialist contracting roles. He's worked in South Africa, Australia, United Kingdom, and the ASEAN countries of Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. He is an actuary, data engineer, data scientist, data science actuary, and machine learning engineer all in one, with 10 plus years of leadership roles. And in fact, I first met Daniel when he was in one of his leadership roles at Pal, as I recall. He's a pioneer of bringing data science and actuarial disciplines together in life insurance. Over to you, Daniel. My kids are busy doing trick-or-treating this evening, so um, there was a minor thought that I would come in my trick-or-treating outfit today. <laughs> um, but I spare you. So, um, and uh, I haven't put any scary moments in my presentation either, so it's a bit boring. Sorry about that. Um, the topic of census data has been quite... Uh, interesting to me since I've arrived in Australia about eight years ago, a wealth of information uh, available there. Um, and largely it's because in, in group insurance where I worked, there often is little information known about uh, insured people that we, that, we, that we cover. So how can we develop more information? It's by enriching the information. But recently, I just want to see if I can fix this. Um, recently, I realized that there was some health conditions as part of the census data. Um, <coughs> and I thought, well, now we've got not only census data, and we can have potentially a target. Uh, and, and a lot of these health conditions are <coughs> strongly correlated with uh, eventual life insurance uh, claims. Uh, but I do consider a few other use cases shortly. Um, so I came up with this personal project with this about four months ago. and. Um, Time does go quickly, but today I want to show you where I've got to 
uh, and ultimately at the end I might call to see if anybody would like to join me or uh, potentially if there's any university students looking for potentially a PhD um, to take this further uh, because I probably don't have enough time or expertise to do this as well as, as is probably justified. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the things that I had to do to work with this data uh, and there's a lot of data wrangling, data engineering uh, effort in this. So that's where I do focus quite a bit uh, because on the face of it, it is actually quite daunting to look at what the same piece of data is. There's hundreds of tables, lots of kind of data sparsely separated. So I will touch a little bit on modeling and, and ultimately on future improvements and hopefully a call to anybody who wants to join me. So, yeah, in the 2021, there was uh, a questionnaire put out there. So this is a self-reported health condition. So to some degree, we need to recognize that it's self-reporting of, uh, of uh, <coughs> responses. And I guess census itself is self-reporting. So there's a, a general bias uh, in, in that. Um, but I thought there might be some op opportunity to use this data in sense potentially setting some public policy directly in life and health insurance and, and potentially disability and na national income uh, insurance. So let's see uh, where this leads. So today I'm really asking more of a single hypothesis. Can we use this? Uh, not to say I've, I've solved it, to be honest. I've uh, ultimately, uh, full alert is that yes, we can. Uh, can we use this data to predict health conditions? Um, but there is, as I said, a, a wide dispersion of information. There's 62 separate tables of data in the public, publicly available ABS census data. Uh, and it's not, it's not easy to work with. Uh, so I did spend a lot of time with the help of Bing Chat uh, working through that. Um, something to note it, with census data and, and especially at the granularity I was looking, there is uh, what's called perturbation, <coughs> is where uh, in order to protect some anonymity of, of respondents, there is some, uh, I guess the word is perturbation of the data so that you can't directly uh, identify anybody or a small group of people. Um, so that often happens where you have respondents, I think less than 10 counts of a certain uh, response or a certain variable, they might um, adjust it. So to the extent that the data in itself is somewhat modified, um, we might have some false conclusions. But I argue that at, at an overall level, it's uh, largely um, suitable. And I'll talk a little bit about, you know, the explainability and usability of this output, uh, and I actually ended up struggling a bit with how to use this information at the end, so I'll talk to that. Um, <clears throat> so for those of you who don't know the census data, they, they do provide a download. Um, yeah, I believe there are other ways to get access to the granular data. I think you have to be a university or um, approved to do so. So my my plan was to try and use the publicly available information. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you know about the different kind of levels of data. So there are these things called um, SA1, SA2, uh, SA3, SA4 uh, locations. Uh, and then you could probably um, compare SA2 to a postcode. It, it very closely correlates. SA3 is a bit more like a, let's say, uh, LGA level. And SA4 is a bit like major metropolitan metropolis or city or town. Um, whereas SA1 is um, much smaller granularity. Uh, in the underlying kind of census data at, at that we don't access to, there's things called mesh blocks, which are even much narrower. I think three or four households in one go. So there are. Yeah, 62,000 of them. So in a way, I would describe this as relatively granular. Um, but it does mean there's some sparsity of data. And I, I'll talk to that a bit more later. So I think this might... Oh, hang on. Sorry. So it is quite a difficult problem. We've got more data than I, that I could use. So I did end up um, going through each of the data tables uh, and using my actuarial and um, general knowledge, I guess, around what things often 
uh, influence uh, life insurance and health and, and things like that. Uh, this was animated. I don't know why it's not animating right now. Um, so part of the effort is actually going to the data, looking at uh, am I interested in looking at ancestry of country of birth of my parents? Not really. I don't, it's not too important for an individual. Whereas uh, the country of birth, maybe. Uh, um, but there's also 100 and something, 180 or so countries, so how do we deal with that? You know, English and you know, languages. There's so much stuff that I didn't feel was um, necessary for my initial investigation. But you know, in the long run, if somebody would like to further uh, discover whether some of these these variables feature, they can do so. So um, I, I did take a relatively uh, narrow uh, view, and a lot of these things are similar to the things that we might expect in in life and health insurance. Um, so I essentially threw out a lot of information around um, households, um, rent, and uh, other things that could be interesting, but uh, limited so I could, I could make progress. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of target, there's data, and I'll talk to you more about what that data looks like, is the long-term health condition that people responded. And um, I looked at some of the variables that uh, I'm recommend <coughs> some of the information we have. So age bands, uh, marital status, number of children, labor force, etc. Now, each of these are individual tables that are uh, separated by location, SA1 in this case, or SA2, etc. Sex and age band, and then the variable of interest, which might be marital status. So there isn't a table at the moment that is a combination of age band, sex, marital status, and let's say labor force or anything. So there are independent um, result tables. So we don't have a multi multi-way table, which I believe might be available in, in more enhanced data. But I argue that we could put them together, um, at least to try and use for some predicting prediction capability. So you know in a normal um, data science uh, or investigation, we might you know, consider what is our data and, and also <coughs> consider what are we actually targeting. Um, <coughs> come out small enough up, is um, <coughs> in the responses there's about eight or so, uh, arthritis, asthma, cancer, dementia, diabetes, heart disease, kidney, lung, mental illness, other, and they're quite small um, cohorts. And also, I decided to focus on what I termed as preventable versus, uh, I guess, other major um, groupings so that I could um, focus my, my attention more on trying to predict each uh, long-term health condition. Because arthritis is clear to me uh, what the, the benefits of, of, of uh, finding that condition. So I um, grouped a few things into what I called lifestyle, diet, and exercise-related conditions, so diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and kidney. Uh, mental illness, given it's so, um, uh, could be preventable or at least treatable, I felt that could be in its own category. Uh, cancer and, and others is a group of everything else. Um, and for the purpose of this uh, exercise, I looked at just those, those first two for now, uh, being the most preventable as I expected. So I've now got two target groupings, one being the lifestyle related and one being the mental, mental health uh, focus. <clears throat> so being a data science Sydney meetup group, I thought I would uh, <coughs> share a little bit of the challenges of, of you know, creating the data set rather than just showing you the final result. Um, and when I'm ready to, I will be able to share with the code as in a repository and my ambition is to open sources and partner with somebody in the future. So, um, so each of these tables are, are quite, um, the data is quite um, spread out, you could say. So per SA1 code, you've got a set of variables that are uh, counts, I guess, number of people that have responded to something. So an example here, you've got male, 15 to 90 year old that are never married. So it's essentially a wide format which is not particularly useful from a modeling perspective because if you add all these tables together, you're going to have about 500 separate columns. So um, 
the common uh, variable I, I chose to use was the gender and age band. Uh, some of the other tables that weren't separated by that, I ended up discarding. It's a, it only had, um, there's no dis differentiation. So the first thing I needed to do was essentially a melt. Um, and I'm using terms from, I guess, R, because I was using R at the time uh, for um, doing this data manipulation. Um, so then ultimately you've got now a long format, and it is quite a lot big data given you've got these 62,000 and what is length of rows. So then you can use things like parsing and string or like uh, commands to uh, separate the, the variables of interest, so gender, age band, and marital status. Unfortunately, the census are, they don't consistently name the variables, so sometimes the male and the age will be at the end and some will be at the beginning, and sometimes they'll have uh, the year, so there was a bit of manual effort in uh, those <coughs> regex type operations. But ultimately, I wanted to create, um, I guess, a data set which uh, had all the variables. So now I've got the marital status in this case. Um, I then pivot wide to make it into now a semi-wide format. I guess the age and gender down the, the rows and uh, my variable of interest being marital status uh, along the inside. And this is for each of the individual SA1. I also did it for SA2 and SA3 and SA4, and I'll, I'll tell you why shortly. Um, so I, I did do a, quite a lot of automation of my process to automatically pick up the, the table and understand what the variable that was in there and automatically name it so I didn't have to one by one type everything out. It was mostly the regex that I had to kind of uh, specifically uh, work with. And uh, as I said, a big shout out to Bing Chat for helping me to take, I guess, my first version, which is not uh, applying a list of objects to the object. And I essentially ask him, can you make this into a list of object operation? And, and it does amazing. Right? So now we've got a bunch of counts, doesn't, isn't really meaningful. I, I um, have converted, a, I guess, transformed the variable into more a probability. So Remember the slide before, we had, I guess, a count of, mouse, no, a count of the items. So it's now to say uh, what percentage of people are married or not married or um, widowed. So when I can bring it and uh, merge it with my other data sets, they can all be on the same uh, structure of probability rather than a count. So I then, yeah, compute the probability, and I've also created this um, list object at the end, which I'll, I'll detail a bit more later around uh, using that for a sample population that I, I created in the end. But now I go through all 10 of those different um, variables, marital status, a, uh, occupation, industry, et cetera, and generate these individual tables. And I did it for SA1, 2, 3, and 4. So um, one of the big challenges was trying to write as little code as possible so it could automate and save it to certain locations and bring it together quite, quite neatly. So that was cool. Um, <clears throat> so now that I've get, uh, I guess I didn't tell you, I've now merged all those tables together. I've got one large um, data set, which has got a, uh, SA1. Let me go back to this one. SA1 gender age band, and then I've got all the married uh, uh, marital status fields, and then I've got all the um, occupation fields and all the industry fields and all those in a nice wide format. So um, looking a lot more like a data set we might want to use for modeling. Uh, so we're nearly there, but we've got some transformations and uh, de dealing with some null entries as we often do. So, um, as I mentioned, there's a little bit of difference in the way they treat ages and, and things like that. So, there were some age bands which were you know, five yearly and others that were ten. So, I, I um, essentially standardized those. Other variables like Australia, um, country birth, I didn't really care about. Um, I, I didn't want to have a, a model that had a hundred and something uh, countries in. So, I just thought out of interest because I'm a, a foreigner. I thought I'd be curious to see if. 
which from overseas were less or more. Um, and created a few other um, uh, variables for myself uh, using some of these probabilities. So the number of children I estimated using uh, one times by the probability of having one child plus two times the probability of two plus always the six to come up with the estimate. Likewise with income, they come in bands. So I'll say $150, come up to 150 to 300. I took the midpoint of those and then compounded by the, the um, probability to come up with the income estimate uh, for at that granularity. Um, next thing, you know, some ages, they are missing data. So um, 0 to 14, there wasn't a lot of responses relating to um, being married or occupations or um, children or other things like that. So where there was a null entry for certain that age group specifically, I went and said, let me go and transform those. And instead of sending them all to zero, I individually looked at it and said, okay, clearly the, it, maybe there might be some people married, but let's go with 100%. Uh, occupations, I put them all into not uh, occupied, um, income I set them to zero, things like that. So um, a bit of manual effort to, to consider what the right treatment of at 0 to 14. Well, the other ages though was uh, peculiar. Um, because some of these uh, SA ones are very small, so there could be as little as 30 or even 20 people in them. When you start putting them into age bands and gender, and you've got this perturbation issue, sometimes you have a row of zeros, which doesn't line up with the expected count. There are, let's say, 30 people. So in that scenario, I um, took the approach of, um, I should go to the next page. So this is the number of missing answers uh, by age band for these different fields. So in um, some of the middle ages, you know, most people, responded with having a, a number of children and employer status. But on those outer areas, we had quite a lot of um, gaps in information. But um, at the SA2 level and SA3 and SA4, there was fewer of those nulls because of the um, there's less perturbation of, of lack of responses. So what I did was I uh, merged all the tables together and where there was a, a missing entry in the SA1, I populated it with the SA2. If both SA1 and 2 were missing, then I went to 3 and then 4, which ended up meaning that I had a probability for almost everybody, uh, and where there wasn't a probability, I eventually put them into a missing category, uh, which was quite small. Likewise with the, long, the, the, the targets, there were a few um, SA1s where the uh, long-term health condition was a missing, so... Um, but most of those have very small counts anyway. So from a modeling perspective, because I was using weights, they didn't really contribute to a lot to the model anyway. Um, but yes, I did the same thing. Uh, that was a relatively late addition to the model because um, yeah, the, the nulls and the missing was really throwing out uh, my, um, my model uh, results. <coughs> so I was going to put a whole bunch of pictures here, but eventually I just said I did some EDA. But in the long run, I ultimately said, I'm just going to mostly leave it and see what the model uh, produces rather than creating a whole bunch of engineered groupings for now. I'll come back to that after looking at the models. Um, but a lot of work was done around understanding this missing data problem and groupings I could create. Um, but maybe I was late uh, for that. So, Modeling-wise, I had a plan to use AutoML, I guess, but I did not finish it enough to present it today, so that would be something I'd like to come back to. Um, so that's the first thing. But I did do a baseline of a GLM, which, you know, actuaries, we often use these simple models, and to some degree, um, there's a lot of interpretability and um, uh, statistics are easy to produce, things like that. Um, and I did a long log transformation of the, of the target variables because I wanted to see what the multiplicative effect of the different um, factors were. Whereas on the GBM model, I, I just used it as a, a more straight um, regression type uh, model. Uh, but as you can see, there were a lot of variables. So two of these categorical variables, age, band, and gender, 
I can't remember the exact number, I said approximately 85 of these continuous ones. And you can see why I stopped adding more variables because already I had a significant amount. And you'll see on the next page, very few variables actually contribute to the model. So I found if I didn't think they were worthwhile at this point, they probably weren't gonna contribute after that. Uh, plus my engineered features. Um, I did use the weights because um, some SA1s have a lot of people, so you obviously want to be giving more um, weight to, to those, uh, those bits. I also haven't produced a huge uh, splattering of results here, and partly because I'm not really happy with it at the end of the day. So uh, this is where I'm hoping somebody with better skills and more time could take this uh, further. But, um, what I was interested to see what was what were the, some of the variables that were being uh, that were coming through in terms of variable importance. Um, so you know some of the obvious things like gender, marital status. Uh, it's interesting that the elsewhere, both the birth uh, overseas and Australia was there. It must be the missing group that is not um, important. Uh, you've got things like income, these PI or personal income. You've got a few of those coming in. Uh, you've got your age, you've got some education, um, a little bit of each variable, which was interesting to see, but it really wasn't um, every level. The, the industry, there were 20 industries. The occupation, there were eight occupations. So uh, very few of these came, came through, at least in the current version of the model. So I do believe there is some opportunity to start grouping some of these occupations and industries together that might have I guess similar um, occupational hazards, let's say, in terms of um, heavy labor or um, office work or uh, uh, in industry-wise to things like mining and other uh, heavy labor that might make sense. So mm -hmm. that is um, where I've got to. But ultimately I was thinking, so what have I actually created? Uh, even though the model necessarily isn't brilliant right now, it actually produces some sensible predictions that the SA1 level is is possibly too granular. So um, so it does roll up quite well up to the SA2. So I'm going to say that from a hypothesis perspective, <coughs> I've managed to um, manipulate the data to make it into a data set that can be used for modeling. Can we do it better? 100%. And I'm actually hoping somebody will do it better than me. Um, but I'm starting to think about what I've actually produced. Um, ultimately, I've produced something that says something like um, what is the probability of somebody having a mental illness who it, it has a certain probability of being married, a probability of it having children, probability of occupation. None of us are a probability of being married or a probability of occupation. We are individual things. So um, from an uh, individual perspective, it's not a really useful model uh, in that we can't say specifically for somebody married, we can say the higher the probability of marriage, the um, more likely mental health uh, decreases, as an example. But as a where I initially came up with this idea is I wanted to create some sort of a web page where somebody could enter the information and, and kind of see how they compare to, to the population or to their local, local area. So, but from a public policy perspective, yes, we now potentially, if we certainly if we improve this, we can now find out what are the uh, predicted uh, predictors that um, one can use to predict long-term health conditions, and by then comparing the um, predicted result versus the actual result, we might then start to identify certain uh, SA1 or SA groups, or maybe groups of SA1s, where you might find that that population is performing different to, or let's say worse, than what the predicted value that might suggest that some policy might could be implemented in that place. But ultimately I kind of felt that this model wasn't really meaningful what I wanted it to do. Um, so I started thinking about already, and that's where I'm at today, is uh, I've gotten maybe 70% of the way through this project and I'm gonna be continuing, is what about creating a sample population where I essentially create, um, rather than a probability of people, of all these things, actually generate a sample population with individual ages, individual um, genders and occupations, etc. And I'll show you shortly what I've 
kind of looks like. So that when we do model it, we can actually definitively say this occupation has this impact, or this uh, marital status has this impact, and then I can probably build that that tool that I was thinking of. But more generally, if let's say that fails, I do feel like there's more opportunity for more variables, uh, certainly more sophisticated uh, models and fine tuning, and uh, definitely expect other people who are more seasoned in the space would be would be able to do that. Um, but maybe even SA1 with the number of nulls and the low uh, count maybe isn't as good a data set as SA2 or, or higher level from that. Um, and certainly other data richmen, you know, SAFE uh, is, is um, one of the, the DESA or scores that collapses a lot of these variables anyway into a single value. So could we even just replace it all with the SAFE and go with it? I still worry about what does it mean, a safer score creating a model. It doesn't really mean something for me in terms of my occupation or my industry. Uh, and yeah, 100% there's a, men, much, uh, many other data sources. It's all about connecting it and making sense. Um, and yeah, if somebody has access to the more enhanced data that already has the, um, the full picture, that would be pretty amazing uh, to get access to still the, that granularity, but it's already um, internally consistent. So um, what I was thinking about was the sample popu population was to ultimately create a population data set using this, rather than have this probability distribution, probability data that isn't easily usable. Um, but ultimately assign a predictor label to each individual, um, so cycling to each of those variables. Um, and then you'll be able to model the impact of these individual fields. So something like, and I started it, but I haven't finished, is I've got this probabilities data frame where I've got a list of probabilities of having these marital status accounts, et cetera. I first expand this data set to be, in this case, there's 12 people. Just kind of create 12 rows and then sample from each of these distributions to come up with um, a labeled marital status, a labeled child count, employer status, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And use that as my data source for, for my model. Um, and that's what my plan is. So I'm hoping there's somebody here who knows somebody who'd be interested in taking this further. Um, and uh, I might leave it here for questions now or later, Eugene. No. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, I just, yeah, maybe a cheeky double barrel question. Um, so uh, I'd be curious to learn what your dependent variable, sorry, I didn't catch it, but like the public health outcomes, like what precisely is it that you're um, that you're actually like, driving the analysis into, and then curious also about whether you thought about proxies. So um, I'm, I'm thinking maybe like public hospital admissions or something now like this that was also recorded by the ABS that you could in, introduce to see if there's any statistically significant um, correlation with with the variables that you have on screen. Uh, okay, yeah, there they are. Okay, so these are the dependent variables. So these are individual responses uh, that I then group together. So, um, and in terms of distribution, um, I went with the two larger distributions. Um, I could probably get your name and kind of send you a few details if you're interested. But um, from that perspective, from the extra data, I 100% know that I would love to enrich this data. Um, in itself, I think. There's more that can be done with the data that's here, but I absolutely feel like this is the right opportunity to work with somebody who has access to more data, who has a passion for this. And so I'd love to enrich this to become a population model. That's what I'm thinking. Right at the end, I started thinking of creating a population, and that's the source. And just keep enriching this to become the super population that we can use for anything in the market. Who knows? How's it? Uh, 
Um, thanks for the talk. Um, two questions. The one, uh, creating an individual population based on probability systems. Um, aren't you adding entropy to the data, to, to the information, and therefore you're going to reduce the correlation to what you're looking for? Yes, it is. But I, uh, I guess ultimately, I want to test whether that the data does kind of aggregate back to my source data, my, my uh, intention. But certainly, because I've got the data from two different sources, it, it, there could be some false uh, correlations created to that. Um, but ultimately, the, the proof is whether it predicts quite well at the end of the day is what I'm interested in. And that the relationships make sense. But um, that is. That's the issue with bringing the different data sources together, and where I hope we can get access to the enhanced data set that's already got there, but uh, it, it would be less entropy than that. And then, um, coming from a health IT background, it dawned on me during your talk that the method of anonymizing uh, this kind of uh, personal data in the future could be to generate models and just release the weightings, which would completely anonymize. So you could release XGBoost weightings or neural networks. And um, yeah. To the community? As yes. As, oh, right. Mm. Um, I'd, I'd be interested in somebody else's opinion who's connected to that uh, field. But yeah, I don't know. If, um, I think in its current form, it certainly is very useful for uh, pricing, per se, but can enrich it. Um, the, the diseases or the conditions <coughs> that are in one and two, I guess, have a lot of age dependence and incidence of them is going to be age and gender and so on, so dependent. Mm. Uh, you treated age as a categorical variable, mm. uh, but the age bands have a an actual order. order. Yes but a nonlinear dependence on that order. So in GBM, mm. there's a, a method for looking at the contribution of variables, and within that, within the age bands, you can look at how incidence ramps up with, as the person gets older, or ramps up and goes down as the person gets older. I'd be interested to use something like that to make some sense. And that's what I was thinking in the sample population, in a way I would be able to make the age into a more continuous variable and see if that uh, can be used rather than my categorical variable. Um, so it's, yeah. it allows you to do a bit some kind of line function. Keep it variable, but have an order. But this ordinal allocation? Yeah. Okay. Um, that'd be cool, but I can talk about it. Yeah, my plan is to actually uh, expand it beyond the age band to individual ages. The challenge will be I just use the sampling as it's now. There will be uh, probability will be even. I might want to try and build a prediction model within that to try and kind of forecast some of the age effects um, through, let's say, young people uh, through older people to kind of smooth through that uh, stepwise function. That's one of my thoughts. Yeah, just just another comment. I've, I've I've done something very similar to this for automotive. You might think automotive and diseases aren't mm. the same thing, but uh, there's a. <laughs> a a strong relationship between the same kinds of models. Um, I suggest that if you looked at diabetes on its own, heart disease on its own, and stroke on its own, and so on, your R squared would improve okay. quite a lot. I think I was just Plain. time bound away yeah, yeah. Of one of some of these things, but yeah, I think um, <coughs> ultimately the idea is that you could do it individually, and uh, so more from that. Thanks. Um, just in terms of the diseases you've got there, <clears throat> like heart disease and stroke, I understand that one of the things that, that I guess might cause that um, can be living near a main road. So you've got, um, you've got all these SA2s and SA1s, uh, which are geographical areas. Um, one thing that I would suggest is to add information about that, that geography. Like, for example, is it a busy main road just there, or is it you know, still within Chatswood, but this is the bit where it's next to a rainforest, as opposed to this is the bit where it's next to a main road. Um, you can get that stuff from a, um, a website called Data by Region, which is also by the ABA. Mm. Um, you can scrape that and then just like add it to the URL. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm ready to enrich with 
lot of information, so um, I might have to catch up with you after this. Yeah, I've got some code for it. But yeah. Okay. Hello. Oh, great. Sorry. Um, so, so just want to actually I'm following on that other question too, because there's a geographical uh, spatial um, dimension to this. Did you actually ever just plot your residuals? Um, spatially? Not spatially, no. I guess my my uh, hypothesis was that uh, <coughs> a group of people is, is uh, in a, in a SA one is explained by the, the people that are in there, affecting that the variables that are chosen will ultimately be the reason why a certain SA one has certain geographical uh, significance. So if you might say, oh, that area has got the highest prevalence, but it's actually because the occupation is heavily heavy manual, let's say. But my pre uh, consideration is that the underlying uh, individual <laughs> information about somebody is more important than the location that they live in. Yeah. So, so some of the people is equal to the whole, rather than the whole being influencing where they are. I'm sorry. I, I'm just thinking that this is, I was looking at those top four diseases, right? And I was thinking there's 3% of the population, which I know that the prevalence is like 10 times what is in the rest of the population, and they're geographically concentrated. So that will that will cause that'll, your model is going to be trying to hit this smooth curve, but you've got you've left out the hidden variable. Yeah. So yeah. In theory, that that uh, my theory is that uh, that population might have low income, uh, low uh, certain occupations that are focused on certain things. Uh, I think the schooling was in there, education, a lot of the things that are prevalent in the areas that have the worst prevalence is these underlying socioeconomic factors rather than the actual location they are. I, I personally think it's more the circumstance uh, that is defined as where the group of people is more those individual combinations come together. Having said that, I didn't test that. So, I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. <coughs> so the reason I say this is that that has been studied okay. and for that group, Yes. Indigenous Australians, even after you adjust for education, income, everything else, they're still in the state. Yeah. yeah. I intentionally actually didn't include uh, them in this group, so I didn't want to create any uh, conclusions out of that without unknowing it better than otherwise. Yeah. Thank you. This one. Sorry, he's gone. He's gone. Okay. Um, my question is more about um, what draw you to start this experiment? And secondly, what impact do you think this uh, experiment, if it's part of the develop, could have? What drew me there, I guess, is uh, probably a little bit personal. I, I wanted to create a product, I guess. Uh, and there was probably some selfish elements of me wanting to build something that I could potentially package and sell it to eBay. Um, create a population model. Um, so there was an element of self-interest and <coughs> found it there. Um, but from a, there, there are areas where people don't have information. Uh, for example, group insurance. So can we use it to enrich data where we don't have information? That's one of the uses. Uh, public policy, I don't know. Uh, I haven't worked in government and where, how they would go about it. But I'm pretty confident they would have better information than this. So it's more hoping to find somebody who's doing, who can get more information. So my next intention is to find somebody who's got some more granular data so we, we don't have to worry about entropy in, in the results. And the impact? Yeah. The impact uh, that it could have? Uh, probably being cynical, but if, if I don't continue it, then nothing. Uh, but I do feel like the academic sector probably has the opportunity to make something out of it rather than, than me as an individual. I don't know what I could personally do to make to make it useful. I don't, I don't have a big interest. So I don't know. Unless I don't have, I have support, I don't think it will have impact. If I'm be honest. <laughs> Sorry, just yeah. one quick one. I know you're being bombarded with predictor variables to chuck in there, but I... I'd be really keen to see the effect of something like the amount of money that the government is spending on preventative health in those individual areas, because from the Department of Health's point of view, 
for, for actionable insights for them. They, they'd be wanting to know, okay, if we actually invest money in this particular thing, is it actually going to reduce the risk? I don't know if that data is available or not. Uh, I imagine it's, it's, it's uh, at least some of the data is in uh, the sources, but um, I imagine even in 2026, that when people respond the next time, there could be a longitudinal study with the impact of uh, spending in you know, times they've declined, if there's been an impact to the company spend. Um, maybe I can make a consultant question now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll draw a line <laughs> under the question there. Please join me in thanking Daniel. We now have our customary five or so minute break and then our next speaker. Grab what's left for you. <laughs>
presentation where we have two speakers. So uh, we're learning about Slam, which is a uh, AI augmented hyper automation platform for organizations. And the main presenter is Gulam Hussain, founder of the data engineering consultancy Atalgo Computing. He has approximately 20 years of experience in enterprise IT solutions, mostly around delivery management, digital transformation, data engineering and other enterprise IT solutions at companies such as Infosys, Oracle, and Capgemini. As founder of Atalgo, he, is responsible for, he has been responsible for various data masking, visualization, virtualization, and test environment management initiatives across multiple clients. Atalgo engineering team here in Australia and offshore is involved in niche cutting edge enterprise solutions. Now, Tom Osborne, well, I've got a profile for him here, but... Uh, he should be well known to all of you because Tom has already presented here twice. He was on our uh, um, employment panel and he was also, uh, you were on the employment panel, weren't you, Tom? I was roped in. As well. You were roped in, that's right. <laughs> and uh, Tom, Tom has also uh, presented on uh, work he's doing in, uh, in active learning, um, again, for, for uh, AI-based enterprise solutions. So, uh, yeah, lots of good things can be said about Tom. Most notably, he was my PhD supervisor, so I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, uh, this promises to be yet another exciting presentation from Tom, and looking forward to hearing what Gulam has to say. Over to you both. So much. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, yes. So as uh, Eugene pointed out, so I'm running a small startup, which, but my background is primarily from the product engineering. Um, in the last uh, few years, we are doing some heavy work in the space of data engineering. Unfortunately, we don't get to do a lot of uh, fancy uh, data science work, but rather more exploring backend enterprise data engineering, like data masking, virtualization. I have been personally involved in many data migration enterprise data migration projects. And uh, 
to the time when I was wasting a lot of time uh, on Socratom and Paul, uh, trying to do my PhD, which I eventually had to drop out of due to my startup commitments. But at that time, we were working on ontology. And so by virtue of working on many different enterprise projects, so there are a few things that are very close to the sort of my heart in terms of the gaps that there are in how projects are run and how different teams sort of uh, create their own silos due to lack of common ontologies and then computable artifacts. Also, sometimes they don't talk to each other, they're not interoperable. So the idea of Flame actually came during that time as in having a common platform where uh, we can model the entire enterprise as in the processes, the features, the data that, that gets generated, everything. And we are doing a lot of heavy lifting on our own till uh, last year, including having our own NLP engine, which uh, probably would have taken at least 300, 400 years for us to build with the resources which we got. So, and then all of a sudden we got this uh, chat GPT, OpenAI chat, and we found out that it was doing a lot better on various benchmarks than our, we spoke, like we, we were highly focused on a very siloed, like test automation and, and uh, product engineering ontology, but of course as you imagine that chat GPT, this, can reason across the general general language, right? So that was a big winner for us. So we started to look into integrating all that. And now we are at a stage where we are getting some really good results in terms of modeling and enterprise. So, sorry, I just took a bit of a detour to introduce Flame. So this is the background I felt was necessary. So what we are trying to develop, what I call hyper automation platform, where every tool set that is used in an enterprise, either technical to support either technical process or business process, that can be modeled on the platform. And this then results on top of the knowledge base of the enterprise of the platform. So basically there are two components here. One is the knowledge base, the consolidated knowledge base, which should be computable. And on top of that, we, we build the model of all these various tool sets. So with that, we can do a lot of things like in a more efficient and effective manner. So that's the idea. So it, and then with the AI augmented like this use case, it can do a lot of things on its own in terms of uh, reasoning and getting some value out of it. So yeah, so that that is the idea. And of course, it, we are serious about eventually. Like the idea is, it's supposed to be a commercial product. Okay, I generally usually I don't do anything that's not commercial. I mean, <laughs> so it's a commercial product, and for that reason, it has to be secure, scalable, and has to conform to various you know security protocols and and, and, and sort of uh, I mean, constraints that enterprises put on, the, on any, any kind of product, basically. So that's the idea. Now I have just tried to put together this slide. Again, the idea is that we we aspire to model an inter entire enterprise. So if you look at a very helicopter view, like you know, high level, so every organization enterprise usually had two type of processes, in the first thing, like technical and business. So it's like the view. Concept of this, as Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, has said, every, every software company will eventually, every company will become, every business will be software company. Basically. So every company, large company, has these processes to support the business processes. So they need to have deployment, they need to have IT development, they need to have testing, and, and there are certain exclusive cases to that. On the other hand, you have actual business of the enterprise, right? If you talk about banks, you can, you know, lead management organizations. And then Flame actually models these technical processes as well as business processes. So the idea is that we will have a centralized repository of formal AI augmented knowledge sort of repository, which can be reasoned upon by the computing programs as well as human beings. So yeah, so this probably you may want to add something here, Tom, in terms of how we view usage and modeling of organization. Okay, the, the modeling of the organization. Um, which we call in the knowledge base, <coughs> essentially it's empty as a start, but it's driven by an ontology. So for anyone who hasn't heard of ontology, it's, it's a grown-up version of a data model. Uh, it defines, in philosophy, it defines everything that may exist or that could exist. So it's a, it's a list of concepts and relationships between con concepts. It's generally hierarchical. Uh, if we have a business ontology, it describes everything of interest about the business, from the name of the business to its organization chart, to the kinds of 
people that work within it and the skill sets to the products they sell and their market and the relationship between all those things. Um, but the knowledge base doesn't exist in the beginning because you know, it's plain we have to find out what populates that, what, what data, what names of people, what names of staff and their positions um, give you the actual business rather than the concept, concept of a business. Now, the way that information mainly exists and it exists elsewhere in the organisation in other databases and IT systems or sometimes in the minds of people who are CEOs and C-suite. Sometimes it's in managers' minds or the sales force's minds. Um, and the learning that takes place to populate the knowledge base is starting from the ontology of saying, basically swearing, oh shit, we've got a lot of gaps here. We better find out the best way to find out the value and the relationships that should go into that. So that means there has to be a model of which database you have to go to find which bit of information and that can be isolated <coughs> out or which person to talk to. Uh, and then when, you, when you're asking people for information, it's sometimes a challenge. You need a second level, which is uh, how reliable is that information that you just told them. So that gives a structure of the business within which the technical processes and change technical processes are run and why they need to be tested and refined to work with current data that the knowledge base has now. So does this, that all make sense? I tried to explain it to my wife in about half an hour, uh, but we're data scientists who probably know a lot about complicated things, but maybe not so much about testing and organisation. I have put together the next slide in yep. as, as an example. Again, a, just a disclaimer that my like our, my understanding is this, this product is more suitable for the business for supporting the business processes. But my team is more like uh, very comfortable with their technical processes by virtue of working on this. That's why we are attacking this problem to like to this sideways. So I've just taken this example of let's say software development life cycle where you have development engineers, software engineers, testers, release engineers, they're all supported by Flame. So on the one side, you have all these technical processes, and then the team, which is augmented by the Flame capabilities, and then there are tool sets that they use, right? So what we will do is that we will we will model the tool sets within Flame, as well as how these people use their tools as, as they go along. So that will create a knowledge repository as they use the tool over a period of time that can be utilized in many different ways within the organization and as well as by any external, let's say, even AI models, right? So it could, could be a wonderful sort of a knowledge repository, centralized knowledge, knowledge repository for everything that people within the flow is thinking about. Yeah. So under the hood, it's a very high level. Again, I won't spend a lot of time on This is the architecture, high-level conceptual architecture of the Flame. So we have a user interface, which is also called Flame Client, and that's where how you interact with it. It's built uh, natural language. Then we have our own parser slash. It's a backend parser. It just I think doesn't do justice with what it does. It's a formal backend. And then we have our own knowledge base. But then we have a secure fine-tuned LLM as a as a front. So whenever you are doing any query, it goes there to find from the knowledge base because probably yesterday also someone would have queried the same thing, what is the status of your testing or how is the problem and, and then it will translate. If it is not, then it will add to the knowledge base. So it's quite smart that way. And then it will uh, put it to the parser. Parser will, this frame test, test automation engine is more, I mean, it could be any tool basically. It could be any, it could be Salesforce database. So depending on what you're asking, it goes there, it gets your full information. Every every uh, sort of personnel in the enterprise is interacting with this, and then you are capturing a lot of useful data at the admin layer. Right? So it's a bit of a root audit layer there. So that's a high level conceptual. This is how it's sort of supposed to work. Yeah, I'll just say two sentences on yeah. top of that. The current way this is structured <coughs> is that there is an army of testers in the enterprise businesses who are worried about what's going on in 
quality assurance about how the business runs and the software systems run. So they write lots and lots of tests and it takes them a long time to produce complete results and ultimately deploy the new versions of software. So those boxes are meant to do the same thing. And we are not the only one, I guess, in that space. Like, you know, you, I don't know how much you have heard about the website actually is investing heavily into, they did a trial of one open AI sort of tool to see how it fares against their manual testers, which is where uh, they are through some other uh, sort of your testing agency. And they found that uh, it was doing like 75% of the things to get a lot of hit. And then now they're rolling it out to a couple of like thousands of Anyways, yeah. They've but only got maybe two of those five boxes. Yeah, but we are doing, trying to do something a lot better. It's very complex, like, you know, hyper automation. Okay, I'll explain the test. What? So, we're, we're going to demonstrate that. Yeah. No, no, but I, I think I, if I understood your question correctly. So, that we have our own test framework as well. When we started this project, we, we were trying to do everything in-house, our test framework, our NLP engine. So we claim as in is a full total package, but at that time we are calling that test automation framework as claim as well. So that is what we have put here, but it could be any tool as I, I take that. Yeah. Yes, so uh, this is a very, very simple sort of a diagram, but uh, what we try to do here is to illustrate. So even if everyone is, everything ha is happening in the same enterprise, same business, but there are various projects. And sometimes uh, need of the project is that some data shouldn't be shared across the other project, right? So we had to cater for that sort of granularity as well as access control. So the concept is we have, uh, we have multiple hierarchical knowledge base sort of layer, where you have some, some knowledge base specific to a project, then you have some generic knowledge base, right? So, for example, just I'm just making it up. For example, uh, UAT environment. So, UAT environment, you say like uat.actuaries.com.au, something like that, and you want you want it to be propagated across the enterprises. So, you you saw that here. But then there are something specific to a project where other projects shouldn't be there. <coughs> so, we have catered for that in our architecture here. So that's the idea here. So, we can silo that knowledge within a project, or we can just propagate. We are finding out like hey, it's quite a complex engineering problem. Yeah, and this is the uh, admin panel. So this actual the product is there. We are actively talking to a couple of businesses to do a software basically. This is how it looks like so the admin panel, right? The central repository, and the concept is three layer project process and then claim component. Claim component is basically our IP. So claim component is the smallest unit of knowledge as modeled by claim. It could be a model of a tool set. It could be simple facts saying like Gulam Hussain is managing director of Django. It could be anything, right? Or it could be something coming as part of active learning. So end users are giving some feedback. It's capturing. So claim component is basically the smallest unit of that knowledge. Then I have tried to just model it because, again, it goes back to like how we have uh, so every enterprise has processes, right? Technical process, business process. Then we have packaged them together, model the process, and then a project is nothing but a group of processes, which actually aims to complete certain, you know, certain tasks, certain changes to the system. So that is how we have modeled this. So this is how it looks like if you want to analyze this to see how the system looks, what tool sets we have modeled, what kind of questions we are asking, and then user have ability to actually rate those questions, you know. So complete audit trail around that. So this is like so as you can see, components are just you can add users to various projects and standard stuff. So basically through this admin panel we'll be modeling everything like what Tom touched upon. So ontologies, the tools, facts as well as how users are using it. Yes, this I think uh, <laughs> Very complicated. Sorry about that, but yeah, this uh, claim component could be any of that. Basically, I'll keep it simple. It could be tool sets, it could be facts, your learning on its own, self-learning. Basically, claim can learn from. If you say different things at different layers, then it has the ability to decide different. If 
for example at the at the flame component level i am saying something uh, and then at the process level i am saying something totally opposite so it will then take the precedence process level so this kind of inbuilt intelligence is there and then active learning is how you are using it so for example you ask a question and you didn't get the answer you were expecting this you rate it like one star instead of five four star so that way it will try to update so all that we are processing this ml modeling offline so yeah basically this then is translated into the new concept and yes now the client side so i just showed you two slides back like admin that's where all the knowledge is getting uh, sort of accumulated this is on the client side so this is a little bit requires a bit of improvement in terms of ui side so we are working on that different people within it so the idea is within an enterprise you have all of using it asking question asking it to do things you know and then interacting with the same admin getting the answer doing the bit for you as well as learning from that right so building that knowledge then we will have more we model a lot of tool sets using same admin for example we need jira we need salesforce whatever <laughs> have a model of that as to how to handle it. Someone is saying, like, you know, get me all the leads since past 24 hours or something. So it should know that it has to refer to Salesforce and not, you know, we are any other tool. So all that we are doing this model. Well, I wanted to uh, actually have a live demo, but then we had to set up a lot of things on the laptop because it was not practical in this case. On the actual laptop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then what I have done is we put together a little video here, and we don't need to go through that like every frame. I will say so all the boring bits where we are logging in and stuff like that. It's just, but the idea is, sorry, I'll, I'll just go through the demo scope first and then, no, yeah. So again, we can we could have shown a lot of things like you know it's uh, so flame is already doing a lot of uh, wonderful things in generating unit testing, creating test cases, executing test cases, all sort of things, deploying all that. But then two three weeks ago, at one of our clients, there was a query about observability. Basically, they just want to they to find a solution which keeps pinging an application, and when it's down, it automatically raises the Jira. And then that becomes a you know log, a downtime log, right? So there are fancy tools like we charge like a couple of billion dollars to give them Dynatrace trace and all that. So this and, and probably that's what they will be doing. But then that got me excited. You know, I thought, okay, let's try this. And then within a couple of hours, my AI engineer offshore just created this. That gave me like you know a lot of confidence as to this is the kind of tool which gives so much so much power to the actual engineers, you know, sitting in the project. They can do so much. This, that's where this word hyper automation is coming from. So then I thought, okay, let's put this as a, as a, as a demo. So I have just for one simple fact, as I said, you, a simple fact, you can just add something like Gulam Hussain is managing director of at Argo, and then you can ask who is managing director of Argo, who is Gulam, right? And it will be the right answer. Second was like a script, for example, Let's say what is my IP address? I just want again. It's use, useless, but just for the demo, right? So what is my IP address? So I can just get that script in the Flame admin, and then if you ask your IP address, it will run that and give you the actual panel, right? So just to showcase, so you can do a lot of things on your machine on the client side. So it gives a lot of power to the end user. Basically, that's the idea. And the third was the engineer builds an object. <coughs> That's what I just explained. So we'll go through that real life, you know, uh, uh, fast in the interest of time. And that's it. So sorry, how can I? Uh, and I, I just uh, wanted to sort of, yeah. Is it a? So, it's all boring stuff. Sorry, uh, yeah. So, login successful, hopefully something will happen after that. This is our widget which we are working in house as well. So, 
again, it's a simple fact, like you, you just added one line in that your knowledge base and then you are asking. Very simple. Just keep those those lines. This is where he's showing that how he's configuring that IP address thing from the scratch. Probably we'll just pass that on. Yeah, this, this is all. You guys can try this if you if it's really, yeah. So basically, this is how you can configure a lot of things. Like it's all codeless. Yeah, a lot of facts, a lot of, and then you can have like authentication and stuff like that. You can select multiple modules within a process, multiple processes within a project, and you know. Yeah, but I'll, I'll just probably uh, second video. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, for example, here, so he's asking. So, this flame engineer is asking, what is the status of the deployment, or something like that. You know, <laughs> because there's a little uh, application that they're developing. They want to know various things about that application. So, just a just a query. What is the deployment project for? So, yeah. The recipe website, basically, the demo we have of two years old. Status is up as you can see. Sorry, I'll just. So you can just ask, and it, it, it gives you answer here. So the status is up. <coughs> so simple of the rules. You can you can just configure within minutes. You can configure it for database server for anything. You know. Yeah. One. I'll, I just want to show that deploy. So. So basically, all you need to say is that, so you have made some changes in your code, you want to deploy it in test environment, all you need to say, deploy website with Jenkins, right? So don't even need to say Jenkins, right? Jenkins is when you are assuming your multiple tools for deployment, right, in a complex environment. So by default, you say just deploy this website, and it will do all the dirty work in the background for you, and give you the result. Some unintended things that could happen when people yeah. run You're right. Yeah. the consequence of what they're writing. Yeah. So I'll, I'll come to that, yeah, yeah, no, you're very, very conscious of that, actually, because it's something that gets raised to the first, first thing. Yeah, so deployment is successful, then you can check, for example, I don't know what you're trying to do, checking the media website, the status of, again, the website. So now this is something I personally am proud of. So we have developed a scheduler module. Like he, he is point delivered, developed a scheduler module in the Flame admin, and there he defines observe what observe means, right? So keep polling like every five minutes or two minutes. So it's, all you need to do is just, you know, say that observe see here. So now, and it's quite smart. It's, if you can, you can say five minutes, so it will it will automatically adjust that observer will be to five minutes or ten minutes or half hour. So with just natural language command, you can control this completely. Yeah. See here. So after every two minutes, if the status is up, raise a jira. So it's it's a bit weird, but he's just saying if the status is up, raise a jira. If you could have said in the next demo, he's saying next video is saying if status is down, raise a jira. So he will just follow. Next one, 
next demo so that is when actual observability when status is sort of uh, is down we expect it to raise because it keep falling and so he brought down the server so that was so now he has set that command now he's bringing down the server so we'll wait for two minutes and then it will hopefully <coughs> so bringing down the server here. So this is where the previous slide, small demo like web, web app we are using. Make it open. So now it's checking the status of the web app. Hopefully it will turn down. automatically raising here so it's all automatic so all the details and we can configure what details we want like time since it was down some logs everything super easy so basically that's what I found this quite exciting because this exact problem was posed by the client and then I thought okay let's let's see how plane tackles it <laughs> and, and we I think we're doing quite nice So, as yeah, so basically, yes, so a lot of uh, features we are working on because clients uh, is require some work from UI perspective, and uh, so we are you know, redesigning it completely, and we are just planning to give them more power in terms of what they can do. Right, so right now, very uh, again, it goes back to your question that we we need to. There needs to be added supervision here in terms of like uh, what these people are doing, otherwise they can do a lot of crazy stuff as well, right? So we are working on the workflow, two-step process, approval process, and and ability to control everything from the client, from the admin. But at the same time, unless we give the, the, the flame engineers, the people working on the ground, some more power to be able to do more automation, so we, uh, it, yeah, they will not be able to do leverage this, 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 uh, this web code as well. We are completely redesigning Flame Client. We are making, they will be able to create new workflow, more like you know, challenging uh, sort of uh, uh, problems, workflows, and then they will be able to invite others to contribute to that as well, things like that. You know, and then it will be regular. And then parallelization. So especially uh, for repetitive tasks, so you can just run ten different. So do this for me, ten different windows. You can launch, do this for me, do this for me, and then your work will be done by flame and then more audit trail as you again it goes back to the concern you raised right so we absolutely need to have a control to be able to stop someone from doing from the flame admin panel right the flame part so better audit trail better ability to sort of if someone has set up this observability or something from their end but someone should be able to stop that as well after three days four days you know because it just keep falling so those kind of controls and then yeah, so all the tool support. So we currently uh, are pretty good with the technical tool sets for the software development life cycle stack. For example, Jira, <coughs> in, you know, all the automation tools. Because, and I told you, because my guys are quite quite good at that, you know. But but then real benefit of this tool is modeling the business processes. So for that, we need to support Salesforce and all sort of things. So that's what we'll be working on. So that's pretty much unless you want to add something. Yeah. Can I just say, uh, one other part of the testing is that once the test results are known, it's presented back to the users so that uh, see if it makes sense or not. Yeah. It's yeah. part of the quality control exactly, yeah. of the process. Yeah. So we are working on that basically to have that loop where we can trace that bugs all the way till, you know, Line in the code and stuff like that. All these are very interesting problems for a tool like, like Flame and Flame. 
and the, the actual test scripts that it generates are accessible to the users as well. Yeah. If they're a bit sophisticated, they can be, but they're not. Well, thanks. <laughs>
sort of uh, implementation you know architecture but then we also can have uh, in house sort of llm yeah highly contained so one one version of any llm so it's highly architecture is highly sort of modular so you can have everything within own, your own sort of <coughs> so you can have a copy of a, any llm it could be open ai it could be llama or something else and then our uh, product is that and just contain it so yeah. that's what you can have and the concept of the knowledge base doesn't leak out from you so yeah yeah, the um, the Llama 2, um, it, it's been shown that uh, small, uh, large language models uh, can perform as effectively as the la larger ones, as long as you keep the scope of your input uh, narrow. If you ask it something out of left field, it's going to start hallucinating. So a 13 billion Llama 2 model will run on ten thousand dollars of hardware and you'll be able to train it yourself yeah so do you see these are the options we all we so there are no solutions there are only trade-offs right so <laughs> these are the options we can put to the client if you are concerned about going down this route we can do this for you right again as i said like at this stage at least and probably in a couple of years uh, down the line i'm not we're not building a SaaS product here this is the background i come from philosophy so so we we go to the businesses we solve their problem put the options and and then we just take it forward that's all but totally i mean this is the concern, concern number one and we always go ready for this in various meetings you know where we are sitting yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, maybe because it has to be a specific very market so you want to centralize to create a system that learns Yeah, so see, again, okay, so we are unfunded. <laughs> we, uh, so I run a boutique consulting, and uh, through that we are we are doing this, and uh, this is my forte, like my comfort comfort zone is just reaching out, reaching out to businesses and solving their enterprise problems, but I see where you're coming from. Eventually, too, like that should probably... Yeah, once we have proven, we are not there. I mean, I, I feel like we are just out of the research zone and we are the like first few steps in, in the process of commercializing this, you know, it's basically proof of concept, proof of value to our friendly clients where I've already done a lot of data marketing and there is a bit of a, if I say something, they take that seriously, right? So we will prove this, we'll learn from that and then we we'll see like what, what next. I mean, you know, there are other players as well. And as long as the LLM is potent, what what comes into the system then goes somewhere else yeah. and it doesn't come back and sort of finance us. Yeah. So it might be talking to your subpart that will generate a test or inform the knowledge base or something or seeking something from the client. But it the, what it's talked about in the LLM is That role, exactly, so that's what, uh, uh, thanks Tom for uh, highlighting this. So the role of LLM in this is quite limited. It's all, our product is, tag is quite IP heavy, what we are doing under the hood. It's just that it, it's taking natural language query and it's parsing into JSON strings and giving it to us. And then we are doing a lot of things after that. Yeah. 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 And all the way back as well, <laughs> because you have to summarize everything in natural language again. So, yeah. it was, hard. it is a hard problem, and it's a work in progress. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, do you have? Oh, thank you. Um, so, with any natural language like input, there's going to be ambiguity there. Are there concerns about you know the wrong scripts being run, or like how do you solve that? Yes. So ambiguity again. So for that, we are this this user feedback that I have come with uh, this active learning, right? So so probably is to start with again, it shouldn't be deployed to the mission critical. Like it shouldn't be doing anything near production data or anything. Like if, if it ends up writing a couple of wrong test cases, probably we can live with that, right? So that will be the starting point. And then I have sort of this uh, feature where you 
you rate it, like you ask something, and if it gives you wrong answer, then you rate it. And if it if it easily does that, then we will take that, like you know, as an as an input automated that it's not working, so we need to find it. So it's a work in progress. But I agree with you, like to start with where we are, it should probably be deployed more at <coughs> test environments. A lot of things that you can do in test environment that you don't do right. Probably you should not do that. And then I'm also working on this this uh, uh, approval process, right? As I said, especially around deployment and you know, so there should be a second layer. So you are doing something, so it immediately you should go to Slack and someone else should actually review that and approve and then yeah. But it's an iterative process for us, it's a learning process, but I totally share your sentiment that it, it can't be two years ago or something like that. But you say have some now because you improve on it now. It does happen, yeah, on its own. It's running in parallel with that and it improves on it. One more question. Just in one, two, one. Yeah, okay, sure. The question is, is there any pizza left? <laughs> <laughs> Could you please join me in thanking Gula? If anyone wants to sort of try it out a little bit again, you know, so please keep in touch. Like I'm on LinkedIn, and if you want to do something about it in terms of like the of the try it out, yeah, it should be cool. Yeah. But we have some big fish at, at five and six times. Yeah, response has been encouraging, a lot better than I had to be honest <laughs> anticipated. Still, that might be busy area. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Before you all go, before you all go, um, this is our customary announcement period. Though we haven't had a lot lately, but if there's anybody here with a uh, uh, with, with a job in data science that's going, usually some recruiters turn up and they have jobs to tell us about. I guess <laughs> you've got an announcement or a hand up. No? Okay. Or any other kind of announcement that you might want to have. Now is a good time. We've also had people want to get up and do uh, sort of impromptu mini presentations. That's usually okay as well. Um, I'll remind you that uh, there is a LinkedIn group now for uh, the Data Science Meetup, and you really should join it because it will help you know about upcoming events. If you have something that you think is worth presenting, you want to present, Get in touch. Get in touch with me or one of the other organizers. We're not that hard to find. Um, and uh, please enjoy the rest of the networking tonight. Thank you all for coming.